Welcome to the weekend recap of Simply Bitcoin. We break down the news from Twitter, the daily fail, meme review, software releases, hardware releases, and the websites by plebs. Joining us today, very special guest, fellow Bitcoiner. He is the ambassador at Satoshi Labs and Trezor and also contributor to Bitcoin Magazine, Joseph Tatek. But before he joins us, we are going to head on over to the numbers. Let's do it. Number time. Sponsored by Bitcoin 2022. At the time of this recording, the block height is 703,384. The Bitcoin price, 47,930. Chain rewrite days, 870. Total public lightning capacity, 2,987.34. Sats per dollar, 2,086. Blocks to the halvening, 136,616. So close, Nico. So close to the 3K. So close. And we had a and we had a bump up, right? Oh, we, we, we had a slight bump up in the price. Do you think it slowed down because of the bump up in the price? I'd like to think so. I'm yeah, sticking would, to our theory, Phil. I'm sticking to yeah. our theory, man. The, yeah, the I would think so too. When the price increases, the Lightning Network capacity, I think it slows down. But when the price decreases, that thing takes such a large jump. I think it's all the people trying to take advantage and open a channel at that time. It might yeah. be that. It might be that. But we are speculating. We don't like to speculate about the Kaka price on Simply Bitcoin. But we do like to speculate about the public Lightning capacity. That's yeah. the signal. The price is the noise. Lightning Network capacity is the signal. But anyways, Phil, it's time for The Daily Fail. Sponsored by... Pirate hash. Yeah, we're always we're always hearing we're always hearing about you know how they Federal Reserve right all these agencies you know they're just looking out for our best interests right they're all looking out for our best interests. Anyways, uh, Mikoshi tagged us in this goes some material for the show indeed it is material for the show and uh, we're gonna dive right into it here we go. Just in Federal Reserve Vice Chair Clarita traded millions one day before Fed Chair Powell issued an emergency pandemic statement on February 28th, 2020. Hmm. Interesting stuff, huh? They're looking out for your best interest. Though. I mean, he's looking out for his interests, of course, you know, but he's definitely look <laughs> he's looking out for yours. That, that's why he dumped his bags right before. <laughs> you know, he wants to make sure you can get the best price, you know, and have all the liquidity you need. Anyways, okay, let's talk about this. So we've got an article over here from Bloomberg. Clarita traded into stocks on eve of Powell pandemic statement. Yes, we already took a look at that. Supposedly, the Clarita trades were pre-planned, balancing Fed says. Yep, yeah, of course, right? And and let's be honest, like who's who's auditing the Fed? Right? Who's the independent auditors? They say whatever they want. All right, let's go. Fed Reserve Vice Chair Richard Clarita traded between 1 million and 5 million out of a bond fund into stock funds one day before Chair Jerome Powell issued a statement flagging possible policy action as the pandemic worsened, his 2020 financial disclosure shows. Vice Chair Clarita's financial disclosure for 2020 shows transactions that represent a pre-planned balancing to his accounts. A Fed spokesman who was speaking on behalf of the vice chair said, The transactions were executed prior to his involvement in deliberations on Fed Reserve actions to respond to the emergence of the coronavirus and not during a blackout period. The selected funds were chosen with the prior approval of the board's ethics official. I, that's... That's the kicker right there. Listen to that, right? The selected funds were chosen with the prior approval of the board's ethics official. This is this is all just wordsmithing and circle jerking, right? When you when you read this, you're supposed to think, "Oh, look. They did everything by the book and they were transparent and there's nothing wrong here." It just so happens that they sold the top of something right before the, you know, the, the worst pandemic in the last 100 years. Lucky people. The transactions are likely to further heighten scrutiny of the ethics, rules, and governance of the U.S. Central Bank after two regional Fed chiefs announced their departures following revelations about their trading activity last year. I think there's, don't get me wrong, but there's, there's more to this, right? Like, we're just seeing the cracks. Like, these are the people that they're throwing to the wolves right now. OK, mm -hmm. this is like when we see this type of stuff, people sit there and they start to think, look, they're cracking down. Look, they're, they're busting people. No, no, no. This is a show, and we're watching them pull out the people that they've pulled in front of us to say, look, 
this is his fault. The, the so the other two regional Fed chiefs, we also covered that. You know when that that came out, and that was damning because essentially, the Fed was putting money into the the fake money that they created. They were putting money into the assets that they already owned. So essentially, mm-hmm. they were shit coiners pumping their own bags. Translation. Yeah, it, exactly right. Okay, so. We're going to keep going here. The Fed spells out clear guidelines for trading activity by policymakers. Oh, it's fantastic. Just make these guidelines for them. It's voluntary guide to conduct for senior officials says they should carefully avoid engaging in any financial transactions, the timing of which could create the appearance of acting on inside information concerning concerning Federal Reserve deliberations and actions. Okay, so look, we're going to show that most of the people that are in the Federal Reserve come from the major investment houses and the people from the Federal Reserve go back to the investment houses that we're going to continue on that in a second. So this BS that I just read to you, it, that's exactly what it is. It, 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 it's complete garbage. It's an utter lie. Okay. Again, it, it's just a show. These people couldn't give a shit. I, I mean, and, and that's exactly why they, that's exactly why they use the word that they're using, you know? So big deal. They tell them that they should carefully avoid, but you already know the policy that you're making. How do you carefully avoid that? It's, it, it's anyways, just totally broken incentives. All right. It also says that they should avoid dealings that might convey even an appearance of conflict between their personal interests and the interests of the system and the public interest. Well, that's why they use trust, Nico. So you can't track it, right? Or you, you have a harder time tracking it. You don't think it's them. Very clever. Still scamming, though. Anyways, the Fed should welcome an external review of all financial transactions made by the Federal Reserve board members last year. You think? And do you really think that we should only be looking at last year? You don't think maybe we should be looking at, like, the last 50 freaking years at least? I, I mean, this is so... This is so pathetic, and and we are so taken advantage of. Okay, anyways, what was I talking about with the uh, the other, you know, the showing the relationship between the Fed and uh, you know these top investment houses? Guess where Kaplan and and who is Kaplan? Talking about the Dallas Fed chair, right, Rob Kaplan. Guess where Kaplan worked for twenty three years before joining the Fed? Guess, twenty three years. You'll never get it. It's so unusual. Take a wild guess. Okay, I'll tell you. Goldman Sachs. Yeah. Government Sachs. Anyways, let's keep going. So yes, the Fed may be de facto independent of our corrupt Congress, but clearly they are not independent from David Rubenstein, Carlyle Group, Lloyd Blankfein, ex-Goldman CEO, and Ken Griffin. Citadel Investments. Continuing on, uh, here's a comment uh, from a... fellow person on Twitter, uh, at Sesfartle, um, how you Americans allow the same people to be regulators and parties in the financial markets is beyond me. And Rudy Havenstein responds back, nothing but revolving doors here. Look at Bernanke. Went to Citadel and PIMCO. Geithner runs Warburg Pincus. A lot of people don't... I mean, it's different if you're in a financial circle. You'll know who Warburg Pincus is. But if you're not, you'll have no clue who these people are, and you'll have no idea how much wealth they control, okay, around the world. Anyways, Fisher is at Barclays. Yellen and Bernanke are giving six-figure speeches to the guys they bailed out. Nauseating, and he is absolutely right. Nico has shown, um, you know, what Janet Yellen got paid. I don't know if it was just last or two years ago in speeches. I, I don't remember even, because we've shown so many receipts at this point. These people are scumbags. It's a revolving door. We are all being played, okay? And as Nico showed in the last uh, in the last video or the video before that, the banks are answer. Uh, sorry, the state is answering to the central bankers. This is scary as hell. Like, where'd my country gone? Like, that's it. <laughs> it's, it's done. Like, the bankers own it. And this, is, this was the plan all along. This is the plan for the whole world because the central bankers truly believe that they are better architects than anyone else. And they are more fit to run this world than anyone else. And we are living through the nightmare that they think is great. They think this is great. You having fun? It's definitely great to the to the elite group at the top, and you know that that was that was amazing fail fail, and and I think look, it just points out you know more information is coming out, right? We covered a couple of weeks ago essentially 
how how damaging it was. Essentially, these the central bankers knew um, what assets the Fed was going to inject money into, and conveniently, those assets were assets that the Fed already owned. So it was like they were pumping their own bag, but at the same time, they're looking at their citizens, and Yellen's looking at their citizens and saying, "Listen, we want to monitor." every single one of your $600 transactions. But at the end of the day, they're playing by different rules, right? It's rules for thee, but not for me. Now, if you go back to the 2008 financial crisis, right? Essentially Bernanke went to President Bush and said, listen, if you don't give me $1 trillion right now, the whole economic system is gonna is gonna fall, right? Like, so who's really in charge, right? And the, the, the thing that Phil was referring to was, a couple days ago when I played you guys the video where you have an elected senator asking Jerome Powell, an appointed central banker that wasn't elected by the people, whether the United States of America would ban Bitcoin or not. And everyone was celebrating on Twitter and I was like, wait a second, why is our elected official asking a central banker whether they're going to ban Bitcoin or not? And everyone seemed to miss that. Everyone was celebrating on Twitter and I was like, wait a second, guys, this is messed up. And this goes back to, and I've said this before on the show, but it was a long time ago. The United States of America should really call it, be called the United States of the Fed because it's not the United States of America right now. Essentially, you have Wall Street in cahoots with the central bank. You have the central bankers going to work at Wall Street. It's a revolving door in D.C. And for the first time this year, they've gotten like, the fiat monetary experiment has gotten so corrupt that we've gotten to the point where the first time in history we had uh, uh, the head of, of the Fed for the first time moving to the U.S. Treasury, to the head of the U.S. Treasury. And I'm talking about Yellen. That's never happened before. So she knows the inner workings of the Fed, and I'm sure she's going to use that, you know, that knowledge of how the, how the money printer works, right, to essentially get some of that money printing into politics. And you see this lately with the $3.5 trillion infrastructure bill that – no one's talking about how we're going to be able to afford the United States is 29 million trillion dollars in debt. So now we're going to just where's this money coming from? And then this goes back to if I spend all my days working, right? How crazy is it that there's someone in D.C. that could just press the, the print button and create the money that you spend your time, your precious, your most precious resource slaving away for? right mm -hmm. this is wrong and if you compare that to bitcoin right doesn't matter if you're the emperor of africa right or the king of britain or anywhere right you still have to spend the same amount of electricity as everybody else just to make that said bitcoin right which system is more equal to you right anyways uh joseph what are your thoughts on this yeah sure like uh the central banking it's essentially is no different from uh, centrally planned systems in Soviet Union or anywhere else in some communist state. So uh, the central bank basically, or the government along with the central bank uh, defines what money is uh, via legal tender laws. Then they issue bonds and treasuries on which everything is based basically. They issue licenses to commercial banks and basically tell them what to do and uh, issues basically like a county loan effect licenses to uh, basically get fed of this system. And the rules change all the time. Like you said, uh, there was a QE. It was supposed to be like 600 billion at first. Now it's in trillions and it's like a QE for eternity. So like it's totally corrupt. And the incentives are such it's going to get ever more corrupt uh, for for eternity, and everybody is paying for it. Like, uh, yeah, it benefits like not even the one percent maybe, and everybody else basically pays for it in terms of wasted capital, wasted time, uh, high time preferences, even wars. So yeah, Bitcoin is uh, something that gives me a lot of. Uh, lot of optimism for the future because, for example, Austrian economists uh, were aware of this problem of fiat money and central banking even before Bitcoin, but there was no way out. And with Bitcoin, we finally have a way out. We finally can see this light at, at the end of the tunnel and we sort of know what's going to happen as fiat collapses and Bitcoin takes over. 
Amen, man. It's it's yeah. it, it's crazy in a world full of darkness, right? You know, the honey badger, Bitcoin, right, provides hope, right? And I've I've spoken to many Bitcoiners, and even with every cra- all the craziness happening right now, they're all bullish on the future. And of course, that's because yeah. they're protected by the orange force field that comes with taking the orange pill. But Phil, uh, there was no, no, no. It's time for oh. the daily meme review, sponsored by. Citadel 21. All right, everybody, the meme for today. First one is brought to us by the legendary Labrahoddle 10. Get off zero and DCA Bitcoin, Bitcoin at 4K. <laughs> I think he's talking about no coiners. Bitcoin at 4K, Bitcoin at 48K. Noobs waiting to buy lower. <laughs> Man, dude, you. I'm, I'm not going to say it, guys, but. I've been telling people to buy Bitcoin since literally it's been at this region. Just it was there for so long. We were at 10K for so long. I was telling everybody and their mother, but it was only till we passed 20K again that everyone got interested again. You know, it's it's just so funny how that works, the psychology. Anyways, moving on to the next meme. It's by Nakadai underscore Mon. Definitely fellow plebe. You'll own Bitcoin. You'll be happy. And it's Klaus Schwab. He's an evil guy. <laughs> Uh, he's holding instead of the Great Reset, their Bitcoin standard. You'll own nice. Bitcoin and you'll be happy. The Great Reset builds back better with the central, the centralized alternative to central banking. Dude, epic, epic meme. And for that, I'm gonna give it a, something that I use every day: my lens cap. Ooh. What about you, Phil? It's kind of weird that they don't have the lens cap automatically, you know, kind of like connected with a wire. I mean, you know, like or a string or something like why wouldn't you have that hanging off the camera? I don't get it. I don't Anyways, know. but I've heard of... these things get lost a lot. Of course. Of course they get lost. You know, like they have no choice. That's why I said, like, why doesn't it have a string? That doesn't make sense. Anyways, um, you know what? Th- th- those were great memes. And-, and it's so true to your point. Same thing. Nobody, you know, nobody was listening to me at 10K. Everybody was making fun of me at 3,500 and 4K. Um, yeah. So it's not even about being right and wrong, but Bitcoin just is, you know? So you're wrong because Bitcoin is. Anyways, um, I'm going with, this is a male to female patch cable. Ooh, right? I so have when you're one. when you're working with when you're working with microcontrollers and stuff like that and you know like low voltage electronics, it's much easier to just use one of these first to test it out. We'll zoom out. There we go. Much easier to use these first to test it out, see if it works before you actually start soldering stuff. You see? And now you know. Now you know. You're learning <laughs> something new. You learn about all of Phil's gadgets. Anyways, Joseph, <laughs> what would you give that meme? Well, um, uh, I'm actually uh, in my daughter's room. So what I have here, it's, uh, it's a little rabbit. Oh, a little rabbit from Whoa. Joseph's daughter's room. Awesome, yeah. awesome scores. I've been telling uh, about Bitcoin, uh, my friends since we were in like the low hundreds. And it's always the same story. It's too expensive because back then they were looking at the chart. It was at like, 10 or $20 just a few years before. So they were waiting for $20, you know? And it's the same story always, yeah. So uh, it's always too expensive and it's not going to get better. Yeah. I, I want people I want people to note what, what Joseph just said, okay? He was telling people in the low hundreds. We're not talking about the low thousands or the 10,000s. He's telling people in the hundreds and they were giving him the excuse that it's too expensive. Everyone thinks they are late to Bitcoin because we've never had an asset like this. Yes, in traditional markets where an institution can just pump the shit out of this stuff and create as much supply as possible, there absolutely is a quote unquote late. Okay, but in this case, we're having a paradigm shift. The only time you're late is once the paradigm has shifted and you didn't transfer enough of your wealth. That That's pretty much it, but that's to come. Absolutely, man. And we're, we still got a, uh, you know, we still got the great fight in front of us uh, before that happens, right? So many things, right? You're going to be saying the same thing when Bitcoin hits 500k. You're going to be like, oh, you know, like it's too, too expensive. expensive. You know, I'm going to wait till it goes back down to 50, but you're going to get stuck. That's just how. That's just how the cookie crumbles. But anyways, guys, do you agree with our scores? Do you disagree? Let us know down in the comments and join our Telegram group. Link us some Bitcoin memes to review. 
because it's a meme review. Anyways, Phil, it's time for The Daily News, sponsored by Crypto Cloaks. All right, everybody, some big news. This is Whoa. this is this is actually massive news, right? Um, we're looking at the hash rate, right? The hash rate represents the amount of computational power that is, you could say, backing up the mine, uh, Bitcoin network. You could say mining the Bitcoin network. Anyways, the higher the hash rate, theoretically, the higher Bitcoin becomes to attack, right? That's what you need to know. So theoretically, right, uh, the higher the hash rate, the higher the value proposition. So it's a good thing. But what I want you guys to pay attention to, right, is what we've been talking a lot about on this show. It's the incentives of Bitcoin and how they work in a decent centralized fashion okay so over here right when we reach an all-time high this is when china bans bitcoin mining within the country right there was a lot of china fud for many years you know there's so much centralization of bitcoin miners in china oh my god china 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 right that fud was killed this year right when china banned bitcoin mining and check this out the hash rate, meaning the amount of miners backing up the Bitcoin network that are no longer in China, has continued to recover because the incentives that Bitcoin provide. There is no central authority telling these people to plug in their miners like Vitalik, right? There is no Charles Hodgkinson, right? They just do this on their own free will. And check how crazy this is. Recently, we all we have reached the hash rate, right, that Bitcoin was in May, right? And again, uh -oh. it's only October, right? And I said a couple months ago, I told Phil, I said, listen, I said it on the show. I suspect that Bitcoin's hash rate is going to reach an all-time high by the end of the year. Let's see if that happens, right? So far, it's looking really, really good. And again, this is really good for Bitcoin. And it also proves, right, that again, miners don't need to be in China, right? This is awesome, right? And the CCP, whether they realize it or not, right, they made Bitcoin stronger. This was another stress test it, to the point that I would put this on in terms of magnitude. I would put this on the level or slightly less of the 2017 fork wars. What happened with the China Bitcoin mining? And again, it destroyed the narratives. Right. And it really shows the incentives of Bitcoin. Right. Just to pull up a recent article, just to, you know, kind of give you an example of what I mean by incentives. Right. Iran lifts uh, Bitcoin mining ban. Farms get back online. Right. Um, Iran has lift, lifted its ban on Bitcoin mining instituted in May and licensed farms could come back online. The government sought to restrict energy usage during the summer's three months due to the high toll temperatures and air conditioning take on the company's power grid. Iran's cheap electricity attracts Bitcoin miners who set up shop there to increase profit margins. Iranian Bitcoin miners have been given the green light to spin up their rigs back online, the Iranian International reported. Since the beginning of the summer, mining operations had been at a halt over concerns that the country's power grid wouldn't be able to handle the extreme heat months. Only licensed farms are allowed to come back online. In May, here's the signal, guys. Guys, pay attention. In May, Iran's former president Hassan Rouhani announced a ban on Bitcoin mining that would last only until late September in an attempt to restrict mining farms energy usage. Right. But again, you have a totalitarian country, right, that, you know, went from banning Bitcoin mining, right, to allowing it again. Why? Why is that happening? Why is that happening also in Venezuela? Right the incentives of Bitcoin. Why is that happening in El Salvador with the volcanic energy? the incentives of Bitcoin. Why have why has all those miners moved to Texas, Kazakhstan, Canada, the incentives mm -hmm. of Bitcoin, right? And this all happens, right, without anybody at the top paying any of these miners. These are just entrepreneurs that say, listen, I have an opportunity to make money mining. This is what I'm going to do. And this is what you're seeing on a worldwide scale on every on each individual making their own uh, decisions to mine, right? So incredible that that has happened. Phil, what are your thoughts? I my you know what I I'm just I I'm just so amazed that China couldn't kill Bitcoin. I really am, man. I'm just it, it don't get me wrong, but we needed that to happen, right? We needed a nation state actor to do something stupid like this to show to show the entire world just how little power they have against a system like this where personal freedom, you know, personal monetary freedom is is part of the incentive. Um, I was not expecting that spike uh, in the uh, like I, I had just recently I feel like I had looked at the hash rate like maybe two weeks ago or something 
that's a massive spike in one day. And I, you know, I want to go back to that. Uh, you don't have to show the article, but the, you know, in, in Iran that they simply closed, they, they simply had shut down the mining operations for, you know, for two months. And, and look, these totalitarian governments, at the end of the day, the smart ones, right, they are going to figure out that, hey, we even even if we don't agree with Bitcoin's freedom proposition, OK, it's still better for us to be a part of that Bitcoin ecosystem. China doesn't get it. And I think China's just going to suffer like crazy. And this is the proof. I mean, Bitcoin barely sneezed, you know, I mean, this is to me like I, I thought that that was I, I, I thought that that was hilarious, that that's all we dropped after after China had done that. And now take a look. Now the hash rates right back up there. You know, the Iranian government gave a, you know, gave a green light to the, you know, the licensed miners. And maybe that contributed to that nice little bump up that we see in that last line. I think that, <laughs> you know, and they're really they, and they announced a ban a couple days ago again. Right. So it was a ban on Bitcoin mining. It's a ban on Bitcoin transactions within the country. And think about this, guys, the Bitcoin hash rate and the Bitcoin price doesn't care. And this is one of the most powerful countries on the face of the planet. And the honey badger doesn't care. Right. Anyways, Joseph, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's uh, absolutely amazing that we have like a globally used ecosystem that loses half of its uh, critical infrastructure and you wouldn't uh, notice basically because it kept on working uh, every block every 10 minutes another block uh, transactions were confirmed so everything good and uh, it's coming back it's coming back in a few months uh, based on the incentives like you said it's a good testament to bitcoin's anti-fragility and uh, it's kind of like uh, it's kind of funny that uh, the person who coined the term anti-fragile doesn't want to acknowledge that Bitcoin is here to survive. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about Nassim Taleb, of course. <laughs> and yeah, like, like um, the Iran news, that's interesting. Uh, I am mostly focusing on uh, like the developing countries on the third world when it comes to Bitcoinization and hyper-Bitcoinization because uh, they don't have as much to lose from uh, basically losing uh, their own currency and as compared to the United States, for example. So they basically understand that the end game is to accumulate as much Bitcoin as possible. And it's happening in Iran, in El Salvador, uh, and it's probably happening in many more countries, probably in Ukraine, uh, Georgia, uh, I, I believe Bulga Bulgaria has about 200,000 Bitcoin that they uh, seized some time back. Uh, and yeah, these are the countries that are going to come on top uh, of that, yeah, of this development. And it's funny that you that you say that, Joseph, because that's essentially what we've been saying, right? We've literally word for word, right, that the countries that least benefit from the legacy financial system are going to be the ones incentivized to adopt Bitcoin first. And the countries that most benefit from the legacy financial system, they're going to take the route of central bank digital currencies to try to hold on to the, that power that comes with the fiat money printer right so in a way it's cosmic justice because it's like the world you know we've been operating in a way where it's like the fiat powerful world has been you know essentially the the trendsetters they've been at the top right but now it looks like the developing worlds are going to be the ones that are, are are fastest to bitcoin and therefore benefit the most from bitcoin but anyway the fastest from bitcoin better said but anyways speaking of evil fiat people and i've told you guys many many times how we are living through an information war and how that's different than a kinetic war why is it different because we no one has to get shot or die but in an information war it's a battle for people's minds right and on the internet here's the thing the bitcoiners rule the only place where you know the the fiat people have any control is control of the legacy mainstream media articles and they have some control of some governments around the world. But check this out, right? This poll by the IMF, I, I think they shouldn't have done this, but anyways, better for us. Uh, they say, hashtag crypto poses new challenges to financial stability. What are you most concerned about? Um, you know, 12% said consumer protection, illicit transactions, 6%, impact on climates at 5.6%. 
75% said others. They also got ratioed, I might add, right? 131 likes and 220. And if you look at the comment section, right, it just, you know, Christine Lagarde, right, convicted criminal, just Bitcoiners saying the truth. Here's Preston Pish got more likes, right? I think the only threat is unchecked central banks that are in the race to debase their local currency, right? So again, in the information war, you know, this is a big fuck up by the IMF because all you have to do is scroll and then you'll find the truth, right? But here's the nefarious part, okay, is because they come up with something like this, but they also post something like this. International food prices have ri have increased by 47% since 2014. I wonder why. Hmm. I wonder why, right? Um, and if you scroll, right? Again, you have Bitcoiners, you know, just posting the truth, right? And this is important because anyone that sees this IMF tweet, right, most likely you're going to check the comments and guess what you're going to find in the comments, right? You're going to find <laughs> a lot of Bitcoiners fighting that good fight, right, saying out the truth, right? So again, this is evil because what they're doing, it's what Phil has said, right? They created a problem, but they're also trying to provide a solution, right? But their solution is going to just create more of the problem because their only way to fix whatever it is they're trying to fix is to print more money, which is going to create even more of a continuing effect, which means the people at the top of the money spigot are going to benefit the, the most, they're going to benefit the quickest, right? And the people in the middle and the people on the lower end are going to get hurt, hurt the most by uh by the fiat money printer right so fiat is like it's it's fucking evil it's stealing from the poor and the middle class to give to the state and the extremely wealthy that's how it works right that's the scam but anyways phil isn't that glorious bro man i i just if you don't if you don't mind can you please uh pull up those two articles again just i i just i just want to i just want to point something out because i i can't help it okay so look at what they use right financial stability so crypto poses new challenges to financial stability could, could you go to that next the, the next one you showed yeah absolutely the, the next screenshot okay crypto poses a threat to financial stability i want you to think about that that is such disingenuous shit. are you kidding me i just want to point out I, what if you bought bitcoin sorry Phil, what if you bought bitcoin no, in, in 2014 huh You'd be doing great. <laughs> more, much more than 47%. <laughs> You'd be doing a whole lot better. You know what? You'd be doing a whole lot better, okay, than if you put your money into the stock market, than if you put your money into a savings account, and you definitely beat inflation and cost of living expenses, and you probably did better than the crappy raise you got from your employer that tries to, you know, mind screw, you, know, mind screw you into thinking that, you know, you need them more than they need you. You know, but, but again, like, this is... This is the the sickening part about this whole thing, right? They create these they they create these narratives that try to indicate that things are predictable, they are in control, and everything is going to be okay because we're monitoring the situation. But then, as you showed in that next screenshot, right in that next uh, article, look at the food prices. This is not financial stability. This is an illusion. It, it's simply put, like that. That's all it is. Anyways. Nope. They're just, insane. They're insane, and we win. So we win. We win. Absolutely. It's just a matter of time. That that's all. <laughs> Joseph, what are your thoughts? Yeah, the whole idea of like inflation targeting—it's totally nonsensical from economic perspective. Because as uh, as the production increases, as the technology improves, you should see uh, falling prices basically in basically everything. Like for example, Jeff Booth argues in the price of tomorrow excellent book uh, so and yeah like we don't see all the problems in the cpi indexes or you know the consumer price indexes because a lot of times the manufacturers uh, choose to shrink shrink the package it's called shrinkflation right it costs mm -hmm. the same but it's more or i don't know how it's officially called but i call it crapflation because uh, uh, the ingredients get crappy in, for example, chocolate and yeah. all kinds of processed food. Mm -hmm. So uh, looking at the price increases is just uh, the tip of the iceberg. The problem is everything is getting crappier and smaller and, and pricier as well. So, yeah, like uh, fiat money totally erodes uh, the whole economic structure. And uh, when we say Bitcoin fixes this, it means uh, 
getting our economies in order, getting our world in, in order and uh, just being prosperous, healthy and happy. And it's also kind of funny what kind of food they put up on this index. It's cereal and vegetable oil, which is like the worst kind of food you can actually eat. It's not, there, there's no beef, like uh, because beef is uh, increasing actually uh, much more in price mm -hmm. uh, because you cannot actually, uh, you know, uh, it's not as highly uh, processed and uh, manufactured in factories. So that's also part of the agenda. They want us to eat crappy food more and more. And Spe for example, yeah. Spe specifically, they want us to eat bugs. Not even kidding. <laughs> The World Economic Forum. Bugs. bugs. <laughs> um, if you don't want to eat bugs, buy yourself some Bitcoin. But anyways, uh, Phil, check this out. I mean, listen, guys, I'm going to get into a touchy subject, but we are simply Bitcoin, so we do not censor ourselves. However, we do have, you know, the ambassador of Trezor here, and I want to talk to him about it, right? So let me pull it up. Let me pull out the tweet, right? This has been happening for a couple months now, and this was a reaction by Coltard, specifically by NVK, right? Um, Passport, um, and Zach Herbert essentially took some of the code from Cold Card and they built on top of that. They came out with their own hardware device. Um, that's kind of like how open source works. NVK did not react well to that, right? So he changed the the cold card license, right? From it's still open source, meaning you could still build on top of it privately, but you can't sell anything commercially off the new license, right? So if you take cold cards uh, firmware, right? Uh, you can't just take it and then use the firmware, use it to build something and then sell it. Even though I might add, right? And here's the new uh, proprietary clause. If, if you want to check it out yourself, even though NVK himself essentially is guilty of what it is he's accusing Passport of, right? Uh, check out this tweet by Shishi. A lot of people don't understand where Cold Card got, where it's, uh, what's under its hood. Started GPL version 3, same as Trezor. If Trezor wasn't GPL version 3, Cold Card would not exist. And mm -hmm. here's a screenshot of a conversation. Of course, it's open source because Trezor code is zero up and you use it all over the place. I don't mind. This is how a Bitcoiner should speak, by the way, because it's open source, right? Open source is beautiful because mm -hmm. you could just build on top of other people's project. That's how Seed Signer became a thing as well, right? That's one of the beauties of Bitcoin, except the fact that you named mod Trezor crypto to mod cryptocurrency and Trezor crypto to crypto. It, it is, it, is it so hard to acknowledge the work of others you build on? It's great to have a library with so many projects contributing to it. Yes, it's GPL version three and thanks for the good code we built on. The credit is read on mod crypto's readme. Let's keep working together to keep the community secure, report all the rugs from our fork too. The repo rename was totally unnecessary and so was renaming the files. It makes harder to review the changes and collaborate. Okay, so whatever your thoughts on this are, right? Um, I think it's shady that cold, and listen, I love cold card. I, I, you know, I've used cold card. I think it, they have a great product, but I think it is sh shady from them, right? Specifically NVK, right? To react so harshly to a potential competitor, right? Um, like Passport, like Zach, um, the CEO of, of Foundation Devices, right? I think I think it was sketchy of them to react in a non-capitalistic manner, right? Because normally in how you would react to that is like, okay, I have to make the cold card better because now I have a new competitor on the block. But instead, he kind of used a form of censorship, right? That is a staple of the fiat world, but is not a staple of the Bitcoin world, right? So very strange. Anyways, I want to get um, our guest thoughts, Joseph, on this. What are your thoughts on this, man? Are, are we crazy when we say this stuff? Of course not. Uh, it's not really new. Like the original tweets are from 2018, so it's been discussed back then. But, um, well, everybody can do what they want to do, basically. And the community should decide whom to trust. Trezor has been built on on the idea of open source, on the philosophy of open source since the beginning, since 2013. And everything Trezor does, be it hardware, firmware, or the wallet, like Trezor Suite, everything is open, everything is free for everybody to use in any way. And yeah, uh, the competition has used it a lot. And we are actually 
grateful for that because they are making uh, the environment safer for everybody. It's if somebody wants to choose some other hardware wallet, that's fine. But um, the nature of open source is to give back to the community as well. But that's up to their own moral standards. You know, we are not going to sue anybody. We are not going to, or we actually cannot even sue anybody because we uh, have these open licenses. But, uh, you know, uh, f- let the community decide whom to trust. You know? mm, absolutely. Phil, any closing yeah. thoughts? Um, yeah, you know what? To your point, I, I look, I, I have a cold card. I also have a Trezor. I, I like both products, right? I understand, you know, the trade-offs of, of both products. It is very, um, it's disheartening, you know, to see that, you know, somebody would go, you know, a, a group of people would go take that part of the code, use it themselves, and then all of a sudden shut everyone else off from innovating on it. Um, to me, um, that just seems like a just seems like a very fiat mindset kind of thing to do right like you're, you're trying to like insulate your you're trying to essentially insulate your income which okay to each their own like joseph said right uh, i mean you know we're not going to do anything about it but like it just it shows to in my it just to me it shows poor sportsmanship and it shows insecurity you know like if you're you know i mean if you were building a product to build a product and to and to really innovate on it and your earnings are in bitcoin so technically you should be able to take that lower time preference point of view and leave it open and instead of looking at it as competition entirely realize that it's also cooperation you know the you know somebody else is going to make a better product and it's going to push you to you know to look at yours and say you know what what you know what can we do differently there's nothing wrong with that that that's how we got here you know like this is this is part of it like we have to be humble we have to be willing to accept that hey we you know we make mistakes and we can learn from them Absolutely. And, you know, I I completely agree with you, Phil, but uh, I think Joseph's stance is the wisest, right? Let's let the community decide, right? And if you guys have your thoughts on this, let us know down in the comments. But anyways, Phil, there was a open source software release today. Why don't you tell everybody about it? Software releases. All right, everyone, we've got BTC Pay Server 1.2.4, and BTC Pay Server allows you to essentially set up a completely open source uh, storefront where you can receive Bitcoin and Lightning payments. Very cool stuff, very slick interface. Anyways, check it down below in the show notes. Awesome. Thank you, Phil. All right, guys, that was our show. Before we go, Get your tickets to Bitcoin 2022. It's the largest Bitcoin conference in the world. It's awesome. Meet the plebs and meet space. Really, really cool stuff. It's going to be four days this year. They have a day just for music and networking. Really interesting stuff. Get a 10% link down, 10% off your ticket link down below. Check out Crypto Cloaks for the best Bitcoin 3D printed merch. Get yourself a Bitcoin grenade, a 3D printed honey badger. Check the link down below for 5% off anything on the store, CryptoCloaks.com. Check out Citadel 21 for the Bitcoin cultural zine, pure plebs signal, Bitcoin news by plebs for plebs. Awesome, awesome stuff. It's by Hadanat and Kadia. Check out Citadel21.com and check out Pirate Hash for awesome Bitcoin trinkets like this Bitcoin board game, this open source Bitcoin poster. It's by the guy that did the UI for BISC piratehash.com guys that was our show before we go i want to give a shout out to our awesome guest you can go give him a follow at sat joseph on twitter go check out his website stack ug.cz he is the bitcoin ambassador at satoshi labs and trezor and he's a contributor to bitcoin magazine definitely go check out joseph anyways guys that was our show if you enjoyed the show you know what to do smash that like button and of course if you want to continue hearing the bitcoin news from the perspective definitely consider subscribing and the catastrophic fails from the imf all of them subscribe again And we'll see you tomorrow, guys, for another episode of Simply Bitcoin. The central bankers have made Rube Goldberg machines of our financial systems.